In this episode of the AZ-140 Study Guide, we're going to focus in on planning your FS Logix storage, and there is a lot of stuff to get into, so let's get started. I'm Dean Safola, and this is the Azure Academy. FS Logix is a set of solutions that has four components, user and office profiles, application masking, and Java version control. And we're going to dig into these all in a future episode, so be sure that your notification bell is clicked on and that you've subscribed so you know when those all come out. But in this episode, since we're focusing in on getting the right storage for FS Logix, we only need to talk about our profiles. And just like when you're planning for your applications, we need to start with the requirements for FS Logix. The first one is simple, and that's capacity. How much storage do you need for your profiles? And you know as well as I do that profiles will only grow over time, so we need to think about that as well. Now, if you have an existing VDI environment of some kind, then you need to look at your average user for how large their profile is as a good place to start. If you don't have an existing environment yet, then you just really need to take a guess. And don't worry, that's not near as bad as it sounds, which I'll explain in just a minute. Or you can just set up a quick test environment, have users log in, set up everything the way that you think you want it, and then just take the average. In my environment, after I've already set up everything and people have been well using it, I end up with about four gigabytes as my average profile size. So some simple math says that I have four gigabytes per user on average, and I've got 4,000 users. Now that means I need four times 1,000 or four terabytes worth of disk space in my storage for my profiles. But wait, there's more each profile will be stored as a virtual hard drive file. And there are two best practices that you should remember. The first is that you can choose to store your profiles as VHDX files. And when you do, that lets you use the second best practice, and that is dynamic disks. And implementing both of these will help you to manage your growth of your profiles over time. It lets Windows think that there's as much space as Windows thinks it needs. And then your actual size on disk is going to be smaller, but it will be allowed to grow, which means you don't have to babysit it. And remember, this is the average user. You will, of course, have users who use far less and some who use far more. And as far as those big ones go, it's really not as bad as it sounds because now you just need to do maintenance on two or three users rather than the entire fleet. Now, I did say earlier that it was okay to guess on your profile size if you don't have an existing environment or test environment. And that's really okay because we are in the cloud. And honestly, even if you had an example user, you probably aren't going to be 100% accurate. And there are a few reasons why. And the first we already mentioned, profiles grow over time. It's gonna change anyway, and you're gonna have to adjust for that. The second is, it's the cloud. You can always increase or decrease the size of your file share with the click of a button, so it's not really a big deal. And changing the size of that share will also increase or decrease your cost as well, so keep that in mind. And there's one other thing to think about, and that is the management of your profile storage. And what I want you to think about here is how we can separate our FS Logix profiles into different kinds of workloads. So the best practice here is to align your profile share with your host pools. Now, this is just like what we talked about in episode three. Your host pools are a collection of identical virtual machines that are all doing the same job. And that means that your user profiles are also based on a specific type of workload and configuration. So it makes sense to have one share for one host pool. Now, there are some other things in your FS Logix configurations that may make you want to have more than one share per host pool. And we're going to deal with that in our next episode when we plan on our user profiles configurations in FS Logics. So be sure that you've rung the notification bell so you don't miss that. Now let's talk about the other side of our requirements and that is performance. We want our users to have as great an experience as we can provide without breaking the bank and spinning up bigger and faster storage than what they can really use. And since I don't know exactly what you and your users are going to be doing in your environment, let's use some good, solid, average numbers to tell us the kind of performance that we need. When you have a user log on, their profile gets mounted onto the virtual machine, and then that will consume 50 IOPS per user 
And then after everything settles down in the logon process, they will average around 10 IOPS per user. Now, some of you might be thinking, 1.21 So IOPS stands for Input Output Operations Per Second. It's a good common way to measure storage performance. And of course, there is more to performance than just raw IOPS, and you can certainly go down that path if you need to. But for today, let's just use that as a good standard. And it's time to break out your slide rules because we're going to get your math hat on and take a quiz. Let's go back to that example of 4,000 users that I mentioned earlier. So we need about 4 terabytes of storage and that's to cover our 4,000 users. Each user will consume on average 50 IOPS during the login logout process and 10 IOPS in the steady state. So how many collective IOPS do we need to support 4,000 users? So please put your answers in the comment section down below so I can see how you're doing. Next question. Our 4,000 users will be divided across our three host pools. The first is a personal pool with 500 users. The second is a non-persistent pool of 2,500 users. And the last is a remote app only pool of 1,000 users. And the question is, what are the login and steady state IOPS for each of the pools? So now that you have the answer to questions one and two, double check them against each other and be sure that they agree because question three is gonna layer on another requirement. Now we know that we need enough storage space for all of that data, and we know we need around 50 IOPS per user at maximum for login log off, but the question here is, how many users in each pool will be logging in at the same time? See, our company here is a large global company that has a follow the sun model. Each one of these pools needs one third of the total number of users to be logged in at any one time. So assuming that they all log in at once, how many IOPS do we need for each pool to support that number of users? All right, so now that you've put your answers in the comments down below and we know how much capacity we need, we know how much performance we need, the question now is, where should we put our profiles? Now, there are several links in the video description below in the resources section as usual, and this first link goes over to the WVD docs showing this table with the three supported storage platforms for FSLogix and WVD, and that is Azure Files, Azure NetApp files and a Windows server with storage spaces direct. And each one of them does have their own benefits. The one thing to keep in mind, no matter which storage solution you pick, is that location matters. Just like we talked about in episode five about our network planning, you should keep your FSLogix storage as close to your session host as possible, which will keep latency as low as possible. And in Azure speak, that means the particular region. So if your host pools and your VMs are in the East US region, your storage should be there too. So which one of these storage platforms is right for you? Well, let's understand some few things about them. Storage Spaces Direct is a self-managed storage solution built on top of a Windows file server cluster, and it needs a minimum of two Azure Virtual Machines. They will also need to have multiple high-performance disks, and you will need Azure Blob Storage as a cloud witness. Now, managing your own server for this kind of thing means that you will have more control over the VM size, disk configuration, the cost, the security. However, it's not as scalable as the other solutions and troubleshooting is all on you. So if you've never managed a storage spaces direct cluster before, I would not suggest that you start now, especially because you can get much more scale with less management out of the other cloud platform services. So let's talk about Azure NetApp files. Now, I know that there are some customers that approach the cloud with the one throat to choke philosophy, which basically means that you want to only deal with one vendor so that if you have any problems, you know exactly who to go to. And with that in mind, some of you may not even consider using Azure NetApp files because you think that it's, well, NetApp, so it's another company and I don't want to deal with that. 
So let me set the record straight. Azure NetApp Files is a true first party service in Azure, just like Azure Files or Windows Virtual Desktop. It is NetApp storage technology that is operated and supported by internal Microsoft personnel who are NetApp experts. This is not a NetApp direct offering or solution. This is all 100% Azure. Now with that out of the way, Azure NetApp Files is the highest performing solution in the cloud today for your storage. You can have 12.5 petabytes of storage with speeds up to 400,000 IOPS out of a single appliance. Now with all that performance does come cost, so let's break this down a little more. There are three tiers of NetApp performance that you can get. Each one has their own layer of cost and performance, but something to keep in mind, if you are using Azure NetApp files only for WVD and you have less than six or 7,000 users, you probably want to think twice. And that's because the price per user versus the cost of the solution. However, if you have other file services workloads, either SMB or NFS, especially any other enterprise class file workloads, then that along with WVD could be a great choice for you. You could put all of those multiple solutions under a single storage platform, which of course means easier management. But life is full of trade-offs and there's some things you need to know to balance out your decision. And the first is backups. Now, NetApp today supports taking snapshots inside the appliance. And that does mean that if something somehow went wrong with your NetApp instance, then you might not only lose your data, but you may lose your backup data as well. So you can protect your data in another way in NetApp, and you could do that with a feature called cross-region replication. This would require two NetApp instances in two different Azure regions and it protects the data by replicating your volumes from the one to the other. And not only can this function as a backup solution, but it's also a great DR solution. Another thing to consider are the number of connections. A single NetApp appliance can support up to 1,000 virtual machines connecting to it today. So you need to consider how many total hosts that you have that are communicating with this NetApp appliance. And that's across all of your workloads put together. So if you do the math, are you over 1,000 VMs? If so, you need more than one NetApp instance. So the last thing to think about in your Azure NetApp files is performance. The maximum IOPS of one NetApp instance can be 400,000 IOPS. And remember, if you have your FSLogic shares divided by host pools, which is a best practice, and you have three host pools, you need three shares. So the 400,000 IOPS refers to the collective performance across all the shares on that one appliance. If you need more than 400,000 IOPS, you need another NetApp instance. So the third solution here, of course, is Azure Files. Now Azure Files is built on top of Azure storage accounts and there are two performance tiers, standard and premium both of which can support up to 100 terabytes of data per share. Now the standard shares by default can have 1000 IOPS per share, but there's a flag that you can flip that's called large file shares, which will make standard go up to 10,000 IOPS. Premium can go up to 100,000 IOPS. Premium also has a benefit that's called SMB multi-channel, where you can increase the number of network connections from your VMs to the share, and you can get more performance that way. As for backups, we've got a few options. You can take snapshots right inside the storage account, kind of like with NetApp, but you also have the option of using Azure Backup, which not only will manage those shares for backups and restores, but the data is also stored in an Azure Backup Vault, which is separate storage than the storage account. So if the storage account is lost for some reason, the data is still in backup and can be recovered. So you've got a lot to think about in planning your FSLogic storage. And don't forget to put all your answers to the quiz in the comments section before you go peeking at somebody else's answers. And the only other thing to think about is what you're going to watch next. Are you going to watch the latest video up here on the Azure Academy? Or are you going to go to the next video in the AZ140 study guide series? And that's where we're going to talk about our FSLogic's configurations. So thanks for joining me today. Hope this was a help to you. Click that like button and share this video with others, and I'll see you in the next episode. Happy learning.